Hi everyone, my name is Lindsay and I'm one of your local librarians at the Oscar Foss Memorial Library. And uh, we've been working hard to put some online programming together for you while everyone is stuck at home, including some of us. Um, so today I figured I would do a little baking tutorial. Um, I know that a lot of you have stockpiled flour due to the uh, situation at hand. Um, and so I figured, why not teach you something to make with flour other than bread? So today I wanted to teach you guys how to make a shortcut Danish recipe. Um, and I'll go ahead and go through the ingredient list to make sure you have everything you need. So you're going to need three and a half cups of all-purpose flour, one and a half cups of cold butter, it could be salted or unsalted, whatever you have. You're going to need four and a half teaspoons of active dry yeast, a half cup of heavy cream, a half teaspoon of cardamom or cinnamon, a half teaspoon of salt, two eggs room temperature, and a quarter cup of sugar. So I've already made one batch of dough today. That way uh, we can move things along a little bit as we go. Um, and I have some danishes that I've assembled already that are um, sitting on the oven waiting to go in. I'm just giving them a few minutes to get a little puffy to raise a little bit before I pop them in the oven, but I'll let you go ahead and see what they look like now so you can see what we're gonna do. So here they are. And this is in some of the traditional shapes that you would find if you were at a pastry shop in Denmark. There they are. And the fillings that I've gotten here um, is just a triple berry jam and a cream cheese filling. So danishes became well known in the U.S. when a Danish immigrant started making them and selling them. Um, he is actually the one who introduced the flavors that we consider like your typical Danish, which would be a, a cheese Danish, a cream cheese Danish, and a raspberry Danish. Um, those are not necessarily a uh, like traditional for Denmark. Um, the 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 cheese one especially was his creation. Um, but that's what we're familiar with here in the U.S., and I think that's what most people are, are used to, and so that's what we're going to make today. Traditionally, um, fillings for danishes in Denmark would be um, remontz, which is like a mixture of butter, sugar, and marzipan, which is like an almond paste, almond candy, um, or like a maybe even a dark uh, remontz, which is basically like a cinnamon roll filling. Um, they would also do apples, like an apple, almost like an apple pie filling, um, and some and various berry jams. So strawberry, raspberry, whatever berry. Um, all of those are kind of uh, commonplace. Um, and in Denmark, the Danish is not called the Danish. It's called Viennabrod, which means Vienna bread, because actually. Uh, it's inspired by a pastry that um, immigrants from Vienna brought to Denmark. The Danish just kind of perfected it, um, and it has become a, kind of a source of national pride for them. So there's your history from your nerdy librarian on Danishes. Let's go ahead and make some. So the first thing I'm going to do... We'll just pop this down so you can see what's going on here. Before we put anything else together, we're going to get our yeast going. And uh, because we have to let that sit for 10 minutes. So we may as well just get that started while we're working on the other things. And to get our yeast started, we're going to need water that's warm but not hot. If you have a thermometer, which I like to use just because I like to be right on money. Okay. 
it needs to be at 110, well, 100, 100 degrees to 110, so you don't want to exceed 110 degrees. And my water gets very hot very fast, so. All right, see. Still too hot. Sorry, guys. water is getting to where it needs to be. We're going to go ahead and add our yeast. So that's one, two, three, four, and a half-ish. There we go. And I'll check on the water real quick. got it. So go ahead and get one half a cup of water at that 100, 100 to 110 degrees and uh, put it in with your yeast and we're going to let this just sit over to the side and work its magic while we're putting everything else together. So the method that we're going to use today, um, it's like I said, it's a little bit of a shortcut. Traditionally, um, danishes are laminated dough, uh, just like puff pastry, um, except for that it's yeasted. But that's a lot of work, because in order to do a laminated pastry, you would need to take all of your butter and pound it out into a big block, essentially, and freeze it. And then you would make the dough, take the dough out, wrap the dough around the butter, and you'd roll it out. And it'd be very hard because the, the butter would be frozen. And then you'd have to chill it and roll it, chill it and roll it, chill it and roll it so that it stays cold. Um, that is a major process. But this way that we're going to do it is similar to creating a rough puff pastry. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually incorporate the butter into the flour, into the dough itself in large chunks. And what that's going to do is that it's still going to give us um, those layers that we want. It won't be as perhaps as perfect as a laminated dough would be, but we will fold and roll. Um, but this way, we're still going to get those nice layers. And as those chunks of butter that are distributed throughout the dough melt in the oven, it's going to create really nice pockets of air. So we're going to have a nice light pastry that's crisp on the outside with lots of nice layers. Um, and that's really what we want. So that having been said, let's get started on the dough. So I like to weigh my ingredients when I'm baking. Um, let's see here. I find that it gives me more consistent results. And so in this case, um, it calls for three and a half cups, but there's also a note in the recipe, which by the way, is from my Danish cooking, uh, or no, my Danish kitchen, sorry. Um, my Danish kitchen, which is a blog with Dan various Danish recipes, um, and that's what we're using today. But it also gives ingredients in grams, which is how they would make it in Denmark. Uh, but because I have those, I'm going to go ahead and weigh my ingredients out. So if you want to bake along, grab a nice large bowl and your flour. Okay. 
and we're working on getting 480 grams or three and a half cups. Almost there. So close. There we go. So here's our flour. And the next thing we're going to do is we're going to get the butter and we're going to incorporate the butter. Now, because we are going to cut the butter into the flour, almost like you would make pie crust, we need our butter to be very, very cold. So I've chilled my butter in the freezer. for about an hour, which is going to make it, honestly, very hard to cut. I would say probably like a half hour is plenty. Um, I was working on those danishes behind me, so the time got away from me a little bit, but um, you want really cold, cold butter to cut into your flour. Now the recipe calls for unsalted butter. Um, if you don't have unsalted, that's fine. Salted will work just fine. I'm actually using half and half because um, half salted and half unsalted because that's what I have. Um, but you can use whatever you have. If you're going to use salted butter, just make sure that you adjust the salt later in the recipe. Um, although I do think personally for my tastes, it needs a little extra salt. So I'm not going to mess with the recipe too much. Take a look. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut up this butter into cubes. And I'm going to do that because it just makes it a lot easier for us when we get to the point where we're incorporating it all into the flour. Um, in order to do that, we're going to use a pastry blender. So this is my pastry blender. It's a little bit different than the ones you're probably used to seeing. Um, you're probably more familiar with one that looks like this. Anyway, they pretty much do the same thing, so either will be fine. If you don't have a pastry blender, um, another thing you can do is you can actually do this in a food processor. Um, I don't do it in a food processor because my food processor is pretty small and I have to divide up the ingredients into a few different batches in order to incorporate it all. And that's just annoying and it's extra work for me. So I'd rather just do the, the hard muscle work of my pastry blender instead. But if you like to use your food processor, that's totally okay and it'll give us the same results. All right, so I'm just gonna cut these lengthwise the long way. And then I'm gonna go ahead and cut them into chunks, little cubes here, basically. And we will throw these into the flour. I'm just gonna do that a few different times here. Now, the butter that I'm using is just whatever was from the store. I think some of it's Cabot, some of it's from Sam's Club, some of it's <laughs> from Hannaford. It's just kind of whatever I had in the fridge. But if you want the most kind of authentic, uh, highest quality result here, you're going to want to find European butter. European butter is different than the butter that we have here in the States because it's a higher fat content. So the butter that we have here in the States tends to have a little bit more water in it. Um, and 
you know, some people think that that really affects the outcome because that extra moisture is going to um, affect the the gluten bonds that form and um, wow and the whereas like the higher fat wouldn't do that and then also sorry about that when it melts it gives us just a, a more like distinct layer though that um, higher fat butter but like I said um, I don't use it mostly just because it's just extra expensive but if you're feeling like making this for a special occasion um, maybe you're gonna have a brunch when our social isolation is all over with <laughs> maybe you want to go ahead and uh, splurge on some European butter they do sell it at the grocery store I think they sell it at Walmart as well um, you can get Irish butter or I think the other ones called like president presidente or something like that so those are those are options for you as far as butter goes in Denmark actually they don't really use butter anymore even though butter is like the traditional way to make it and it's also what most people would use in their home kitchens if you were to make this um, at home in Denmark but most of the commercially made ones now are, are made using like a vegetable shortening um, which is you know my guess is probably just because um, it appeals to a broader audience of dietary needs but um, butter is the traditional way and as far as I'm concerned butter is always better so if you can do it do it if you can't do dairy um, if you have an allergy or um, you just choose um, not to eat dairy you can certainly make this with uh, whatever kind of vegetable shortening that you are used to using. You would just need to make sure that it's very cold, just like this butter is, and hard. Um, so pop it in the freezer for a bit and make sure it gets nice and hard. Okay. So now we've got our butter here. It's all chunked up here and it's in our flour. And we're gonna go in with our pastry blender to break up this butter. Um, it's gonna give us kind of a crumbly texture and we're going to try and do it so that the largest sized pieces are about the size of a kidney bean. So um, when you do the same process when you're making pies or pie dough, uh, you do it until it's about pea sized, but this one we're looking for a little bit bigger chunks, that kidney bean size. So let's go ahead and get in there. Now this does take a little bit of work and obviously if your butter is really hard because you've frozen it, um, it's going to take a minute. But any of you who have uh, bought pies from me under my other <laughs> title, the pie smith, um, this is the process that I do to make dough. So all my dough is handmade. And I do it with a pastry blender. And so, yep, we're just going around and cutting in there. If your butter is too hard, like, I have a really um, kind of heavy-duty pastry blender, but if your pastry blender is, like, more flimsy, like the one that I showed you before, and you find that it's not holding up to the hard butter, you can just, you know, walk away for, I don't know, 10 minutes or something to let that butter butter soften up a little bit and then try again then we do want to keep the butter as hard as we can manage it because that's going to um, those big chunks are what are going or what's going to make a really nice light and fluffy pastry when it melts in the oven when it's baking but um, as long as you don't mix this into kind of a big glob with melted butter you'll be fine one of the reasons also uh, while I uh, while I'm talking about mixing this in globs of butter is um, one of the reasons why I don't love the food processor is that if you overfill it um, if you put the ingredients in or the butter's not cold enough or whatever it can end up uh, mixing the butter and the flour together too much 
and then you just get like this like big kind of paste um, and you lose the distinct chunks of butter and that is not going to give us what the results that we want that would just basically give us like a really dense chewy pastry not like a light fluffy crispy pastry that we want and so um, you know I would just say if you're gonna use the food processor be aware of that and just make sure that you're checking on it like a lot it doesn't take very long for it to get where it needs to be um, but you know, make sure that you're like, and, and that happens too if you overload the food processor. So, you know, make sure you're doing it in batches and um, that you're checking on it so that it doesn't get over mixed like that. Um, because you, again, you wanna maintain those nice distinct chunks of butter like we've gotten here. We're almost there. So I got a few big ones in here. So when I'm done with this, I'm probably gonna pop in those ones that I've assembled behind me. I think they'll be about ready to go in and bake. All right. So it looks like we're about there. just give this a, a toss here to look for big clumps if you find any that are too big just break them up with your fingers real quick all right that looks pretty good let's check on our yeast and see how that's doing All right, so here's our yeast. It's looking pretty good. I think we'll be ready to use that pretty quickly here. So why don't we go ahead and get our other ingredients together and then we can pretty much just combine everything. Do fine. Okay. So basically what we're going to do now is we're going to finish adding the other ingredients. We will combine that with the yeast mixture and then gently mix that all into our flour and butter over here. Once that happens, we're going to need to put the dough in to rest for a minimum of three hours. Now, You can also leave that dough in there for up to three days. If you want to make this ahead and make uh, make the dough ahead and make the danishes later, you can totally do that. Um, personally, for me, I think that the sooner you use the dough, the better after that initial resting period. Um, just because the yeast will continue to kind of, I mean, it's already activated, so it's going to continue to do its thing. And sometimes if you let it uh, sit in there too long, it can kind of taste a little too fermented. Um, you'll get almost like a beer flavor. Uh, but if you're into beer pastry, by all means, go for it. Um, I think the longest I've left the dough in there was like five days, and that's when that's when I got that weird flavor. Um, it baked just fine, looked beautiful, but tasted strange. So keep that in mind. Um, but this is a great recipe to make at night. Like, I don't know, right before bed. Throw these ingredients together, toss the, the, the dough in the fridge to rest overnight, wake up in the morning, and then all you have to do is roll them, fill, um, fill them, and bake them, and then you've got breakfast. So, um, And so that's pretty much what I'm going to do tonight. Um, like I said, I do have a, a batch behind me that I'll be baking momentarily so you can see the results, but the rest of my dough is going to be breakfast for tomorrow. So we're going to go ahead now and combine the rest of the ingredients. And what we need at this point is uh, we need our eggs. 
Now the eggs should be room temperature. I'm not sure if I mentioned that in the beginning. The reason why is that um, we have this yeast over here that's still a little bit warm doing its thing. And we don't want to ruin that with really cold eggs. Um, the cream, if you can have it at room temperature, is also helpful. But at least if some of it is room temperature, it'll be enough to take the chill off the cream if you keep the cream in the fridge. If the eggs are, are where they need to be. Okay. So, we need a half a cup of heavy cream. So I'm gonna go ahead and pour that into this bowl here. It's down so you can see. There's my heavy cream. And we're gonna add our cardamom. So here's cardamom. Cardamom is a super popular spice in Denmark. They use it in a lot of their baked goods. Um, I use it in my Abelskiver, which I'm not sure if any of you have had those. They're like pancake balls almost. I've made them at the farmer's market before, but um, they're pretty good. But yeah, this goes in that most commonly. Um, but like I said, it also goes in danishes. If you don't have cardamom because it's kind of a weird thing, um, you can substitute cinnamon or any one of those like kind of warm, spicy, sweet spices. Um, you could even use like pumpkin pie spice if you've got any of that or apple pie spice, that kind of spice blend. Um, you could probably sub allspice or something like that. But most people have cinnamon, so that's why I say if you don't have cardamom, just sub cinnamon. And you can just do like it measure for measure, so... Um, in this recipe, we're going to add a half a teaspoon. It smells so good. It's such an interesting scent because it's like partially sweet, and partially kind of pungent. It's just very interesting. It's very unique. There's my caramel. Throw in some eggs. Danishes, I'm just peeking over here, are a little puffy because they've risen a bit. Let's show you these. You can see how they're kind of puffed up a little bit. And they're ready to go in to bake. So I'm going to bake those at 375. Um, that's because I'm using Convect, but if you're using a regular conventional oven, you could do it higher, like 400. Check them at 15 minutes because they're smaller. All right, back to our cream egg mixture. So I've added the two eggs and then into my cream, and I've got my cardamom here, and I'm gonna add a little bit of salt. The recipe calls for a half teaspoon. Remember, we already used some salted butter, so I could reduce that at this point if I wanted to, but I like a little bit of salt in there, and so I feel like it brings out that buttery flavor, so I'm just going to do the whole, the whole half teaspoon that is called for here, and I'm going to give that a whisk. Alrighty. So this is pretty well combined now. And we're gonna go ahead and add this into our yeast and water mixture over here. Um, we do need, before we do that, we do need a fourth of a cup of sugar. Ooh, my phone, my, my computer just went to sleep on me. Are we still recording? We're good, okay. Okay, sorry about that. All right, we're gonna need a quarter cup of granulated sugar, 
right there into the cream mixture. And now we're going to combine that into our yeast. Get all that good stuff out of there. All right. And we're just going to lightly combine this. We're not going to whisk real hard because um, that yeast has, has been working hard in there. We're just going to make sure everything's nice um, and incorporated. Okay. And now we are going to combine our wet ingredients with our flour and our butter that we cut in just a few moments ago. And I'm going to do that with a spatula. So we don't want to mix this too much. When I'm done mixing this, it's going to look still pretty chunky and even maybe a little crumbly. And that's what we want. We don't really want to, at, to get that um, gluten going until we're ready to roll out the dough later. So we just kind of want it to be just barely put together. Um, people often over mix uh, when it comes to pastry and so we're going to be aware of that. So we're going to pour in about half of this to start. And we're just going to go ahead and fold that in. Try and evenly uh, distribute that uh, mixture of wet ingredients here. Okay, now we're going to add the rest. Now, if you're making this at home and you've got the kids around, you can totally just have them wash their hands and let them get in here and get messy and use their hands to combine it if they want or if you want. And we're just going to keep on kind of working this around, kind of folding it in until all of that flour is moistened. So you kind of want most of that flour to be gone. Oops. <laughs> um, we want everything to kind of be nice and moist, but we really don't want it to be over mixed at all. We don't want it to be like a hard ball of dough. We just kind of want it nice and loose like this. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. I'm gonna get in there with my hands for a sec and just make sure that it's all even. Um, it's easier that way for me. I like to feel it. Just helps me get a better idea of how it's going, making sure that everything's evenly distributed here. Just kind of gently fold it over here. Okay, that's looking pretty good. So that's pretty much it for the dough. What we're going to do now is we're just going to cover it up, sit it in the refrigerator to chill for a minimum of three hours, but like I said, it could be up to three days. All right. So I'm just gonna pop this in the fridge and I'm gonna pull out the dough that I've got that's already finished so you can see what it's gonna look like. All right, so here's the finished dough. Um, I have already worked half of this dough into the shapes that I showed you earlier that are currently baking, um, but it's time to get this weird clump of lumpy whatever into 
dough that we can shape and fill and uh, and so we're gonna do that now and so um, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to let's see I'm gonna move this computer I'm gonna move the computer over to my rolling station okay let's see here put it here can you guys see that okay Maybe you should be closer. Hmm. There's an art. There's an art to kitchen recording without a tripod. <laughs> and it's called books. All right. get a good a good view going on here all right that's pretty good that's okay all my vitamins over there <laughs> okay so let's get our dough we'll get our flour and get going peek on my pastries in here oh yes they're looking good some of them came a little undone. That happens. I didn't use an egg wash on them, and I should have, but... Eh. All right, so sprinkle a clean surface with flour. And we're going to plop our dough right onto that. Go ahead and shape that dough into kind of like a rectangle just so we're sort of starting with the right shape. And now the fun part. Now again, because this is traditionally a laminated pastry with several layers, we're going to try and recreate that here with our dough. And the way that we're going to do that is we're just going to roll it out and fold it a bunch of times. Roll it, fold it, roll it, fold it. So we're going to do this process three times. Um, we're going to start by rolling it out into a nice rectangle. And you'll notice that the more you work the dough, the more it'll look like dough. Right now, it's still kind of just this weird kind of lumpy mass. As you can see, it's very, very lumpy. That's okay. So we're going to roll this out fairly thin. We want it to be about 12 by 20 ish. It doesn't have to be that big really, but you know, sort of ish like that. It'll be fairly thin because we're going to be folding it quite a bit. Whew. Oh my goodness, I'm smelling those other danishes baking and they smell so good. I'm excited. good. So now we're going to fold. We're going to fold in thirds. So we fold that one in on that side and that one over it. Then we're going to fold the same way but up right there into thirds again. And now we're left with this nice little rectangle. Looks like a nice little neat kind of dough package. <laughs> so make sure you're adding flour as you go so it doesn't stick to your surface. Put some on there. Okay. And now we're going to do it again. So we're going to roll. Now you'll notice that I put the the side with um, that we like we had folded it like this way and that uneven edge. I'm putting it on the bottom just to keep it neat. And that'll help keep it in place as we're rolling. Okay. 
And you can see already that this dough, as it's being rolled, it's starting to look more like dough and less like a lumpy mass. And we're really just strengthening those gluten bonds right now as we work the dough. You can still see all those lumps of butter in there. And like I said, when those melt, that's what's going to give us those nice kind of that aeration that we want in the pastry. So it's nice and light and delicious. a little bit more this way. It's a bit of a workout, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> All right. That's pretty good. So one more time, we're going to do our fold like we did last time in thirds. And now we're going to do this process again. And it is getting easier to roll as we go just because it's, that butter is getting a little softer. All right, I'm gonna check on these guys. Oh yes. Looks like our danishes are ready to come out. Let's take a break and take a look at those. We'll just spin you around here. Let's see. Um, yeah, we could use a touch longer, I suppose. Looking pretty good. I didn't egg wash these just in the interest of time. But if you want that nice shiny um, coat on your danishes, you can egg wash them right before you bake. It'll also help them stay together like the when you're doing the shapes. Um, and you're pressing the dough into itself. You can see on mine when I pull them out that they kind of separated a little bit because I did not use an egg wash. It doesn't really affect the flavor. Um, it's just kind of an extra step. So once this dough is all finished, we still got one more to go, right? Are we on? Let's see. Yeah, I think we got one more time. Oh, that's our timer. Caution. If you have ADD like me, make sure you have a way to count. can't tell you how many times I've been baking and like how to stop and start over because I forgot how many cups of flour I put in. The struggle is real, my friends. All right. One more round of folding. All right. Here we go. And thirds. And thirds. Yeah, there we go. Last time, guys. I know your arms are getting tired. Who knew baking was such a workout? <laughs> All right, 
these danishes gotta come out. Um, yes, yeah, so I was going to say that um, you may choose to do small individual danishes or you could do a big danish braid and honestly the danish braid it looks really impressive and really beautiful um, and it's a lot less work. It looks a little hard because you kind of have to braid it it's, but um, it's really it's really not really not that complicated. It's, it's a lot easier than it looks. So I'm almost there guys, almost there. Should have put on some motivational music for all this rolling. Some Eye of the Tiger right here. <laughs> all right. Now, depending on how you want to um, shape your your pastries, you may either want to roll this into a square or roll it into a rectangle. Um, I'm going to roll it into a square because I'm going to do individual danishes. And in order to do that, I need to basically cut out a bunch of little miniature squares. Almost there. All right. It's looking pretty good. See if we can get those edges a little neater. Get to go out a little further. All right. Now all of that folding is what you're going to see in a second. I'll show you with that batch that's finished. That's what gave it all that beautiful layered look. All right. So get in there with a knife. Clean up your edges. Save your scraps. Do whatever you want with them. You can bake them. Better not to waste, especially right now. That's pretty good. And I'm just going to cut this. So I'm trying to think of how many inches this is. Maybe 12 by 12. It's probably about right. So I'm cutting it into quarters right now. Alright, and each of these is going to be cut into four. All right, now we've got a bunch of squares. They're, you know, even-ish. <laughs> and these can each be shaped into an individual danish, or you could just bake it how they are. So I'm gonna show you how to do a couple different shapes. Um, some of the traditional shapes are the ones that I've baked over there on the side. The easiest one to do is you just take all the corners and you just kind of fold them in 
like that. So you can see you just fold them all in like that and then you want to push down here. So you fold them all in on top of each other like that. You smush them in with your thumb and then that gives you like a little well that you can put your filling in just right in the middle here. Another one you can do is the pinwheel. So this one's called the Spandauer, I think. Spandau. Um, another one you can do is, this one's pretty easy, you just pull the corners in like this, two corners. Make sure that filling's in between before you fold them over. And then you're just going to pinch right there. Oops. You're going to pinch right there. If you put a little bit of egg wash over here, it'll help hold it together a little bit more. I'm actually going to undo that. It's not filled. Um, and then you can also do the pinwheel. That one is a another traditional shape. So what you're going to do to do that is you're going to take your square and you're going to cut in at the corners. Not all the way into the middle, but you know, eh, three quarters of the way in. You could do a little less if you want a little more space there, a little bigger well for your um, jam. And then you're going to basically have like these, you're going to basically have like these little triangles here. And so you're just going to take one corner of each triangle and move it to the center. And then pinch it there with your thumb. There you go. There's that. And then I like to make them look a little more rounded so it looks like a wheel, an actual wheel. And then you can stick your filling right there. And the last one I'm going to show you how to do, I don't actually know what this one's called. But you want to take your square, you want to fold it over, half, like this, okay? And then you're going to go in with a knife, and you're just going to cut. Now you're not going to cut all the way up. You're just going to cut like a triangle. See, I almost did it too deep. Nope, I still did it okay. So you're going to have like a, a triangle there, but it's still attached. See that? So when you unfold it, you unfold it, it's going to look like this. And you're just going to fold. You're going to take this corner and meet it with the inside corner of that new square. And the same with the other side. And it creates like a fun little crisscross shape. Like that. You're going to want to fill that before you fold it over. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at what those are going to look like when they're all done. Here are my finished danishes. Um, I filled mine with a um, triple berry jam. It's basically just pie filling. Um, that's what I always use because I've, you know, I've made pies for so long. I kind of always have a mix around for that, like dry ingredient mix that I just throw on some fruit. But you could certainly use just any jam, jam that you buy at the grocery store in a jar. You could make your own. Um, you could also use pie filling, like cherry pie filling or um, apple pie filling. Anything like that would do just fine. And then here's the cheese ones that I made. So the cheese, all I did was I just melted a, um, I softened, I guess, a brick of cream cheese. Um... I put it in the microwave until it was kind of easy to work with and then I beat in an egg and three tablespoons of sugar and beat that all in and combine that nicely and then I just use that to fill it in um, and then once they were filled um, I didn't do it so here's that other one I was showing you oh that one's so pretty um, once uh, you have filled all your pastries you can go on um, with a in with an egg wash. So you can just beat an egg. You can just beat an egg um, and add a little bit of milk or a little bit of water to thin it out and then you'll just go in with a basting brush and you're just going to want to baste the 
pastry where it's, you know, showing here, like so. And then when it bakes, it'll give you a nice glossy sheen. But of course, you don't have to do that if you don't want to, um, but it does look very impressive. Lastly, if this isn't fancy enough for you, you can glaze them with an icing, just a simple icing with milk and powdered sugar will do fine, and a little bit of vanilla, um, or almond. Um, al almond would probably be more common if you were going authentic, a little bit of almond extract or a little bit of vanilla extract. And, um, you know, just start with some powdered sugar and just add enough milk to thin it to a point where it's a drizzling consistency. And then just go ahead and drizzle it over here, sprinkle with maybe some slivered almonds, and you have a beautiful um, selection of handmade danishes. So remember how I've been going on about all the lamination and all the layers? You can see when I get up close, you can see those layers here. See all those layers that we worked to create. You can see them there too. Here they are. Mm. I just took a bite and you can see those layers in there and those pockets that I was talking about. So there you go. Thanks for joining me in my kitchen. That's been your tutorial on how to make danishes. I'll make sure to share the link for the recipe if you'd like to make them on your own. Have a good one.